Welcome. My name is John Ann Hilmer, and I'm the director of the Global Women Leadership Program at the business school formerly known as CAS. And thank you all for joining us. I was looking at the restaurants today, and one of the highlights of this very difficult year for us has been the how international our audience has become. We welcome you. I've seen names from Brazil to the Philippines, and I'm so glad you're joining us. To give you a little bit background uh, about the program, our main goal for the program is to promote and support gender equity both within the school and outside. Launched in 2017, the program has three main work streams. We coordinate scholarships for high potential women to study at CAS. And please do watch out for the next two scholarships that are up. Our full-time MBA scholarship due date is the 7th of March and our executive MBA scholarship is due 28th of May. You can find this information on our website. Second, we organize events with inspiring speakers to equip and empower women for leadership, just like this event today. And again, Keep an eye out for our events on the 8th of March for International Women's Day entitled Overcoming Job Challenges and Achieving Professional Growth During the 19 Pandemic. And finally, we connect women by nurturing networks for their success. You can find all this information up on our website or if you choose to join our net newsletter. I have to say, I'm personally very excited about the event. As some of you may know, the business school has been going through a period of reflection, which started with the decision to drop our name due to Sir John Cass's extensive ties to slavery. What you might not know yet is that this decision also started a process for us to reflect on who we are and what we stand for. I'm sure you will be hearing about some of these discussions in the short. We are a world-renowned globally ranked business school, but the question then is how do we use our voice? With this mission or this background, I'm sure you can understand why I am looking forward to this event. In tonight's panel discussion, we will ask experts as well as women who have chosen to use their position and power to, to show how we can help each other, particularly those who are not as privileged but have something important and valuable to say. We're going through a time of uncertainty and it like the only way to get out of the stronger is by supporting each other. So let's listen to our experts to understand how we can do that. And is moderated by Kiara Goodwin, who is the scholar for the Global Women's Leadership Program for the full-time MBA this year. She has been the behind this exciting and thought-provoking event, and she will introduce our panelists in detail, so I don't want to steal her there. For now, I would like to say to our panelists, dear Isabel, Lugia, and Rana, thank you for sharing with us your time and your expertise. Before we begin, a brief point of housekeeping. This event is recorded for the Q&A session, which will be held at the end of the panel discussion. Please submit your questions to the panel members using the Q&A function. And if you would like to tweet about the event, please do add in our handle at CAS Business, School, at CAS Business and our hashtag at, um, CAS Women. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Janan. Hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a great conversation in store and I'm really grateful to tonight's panelists joining me as we dig into these tough topics. Before I introduce our wonderful panel, I thought I'd give a little context to this evening's discussion. So as we all know, Issues of diversity, power, equality, and bias are not easy ones to unpack. 
Many of us have had to unpack some of these issues more recently. For some of us last summer, as there was a greater awareness around discrimination and racism in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. I personally was encouraged to hear folks ask a really great question of what can I do? I noticed that some of the people in my network who were marching and protesting and sharing things on social media were also trying to determine how to drive change in their professional lives. It was a question of how to move from conversations and small scale change to larger, larger sustainable impact. So tonight, the goal is to address those questions and discuss some actionable steps that women can take within our sphere, spheres of influence. So throughout our conversation, you'll likely hear us talk a lot about gender, race, and ethnicity. We do recognize that diversity is multifaceted and it encompasses not only gender, race, and ethnicity, but also religion, sexual orientation, disability, socioeconomic status, and so much more. There's incredible value in spending time on each of these, but we do wanna have you out of here at a reasonable time this evening. And so we also want to leverage the expertise of our panel. So we will try our best to weave in varied experiences of diverse groups, but I'd also encourage you when you hear us speak about a certain facet of diversity, try and make connections in your mind to uh, links within your own network. Consider what does the application of this look like in my sphere of influence? The examples may be focused, but the recommendations can be applied across a multitude of situations. So enough of me, let's dive in. First, I'd like to introduce Rana Salhab, People and Purpose Partner and Regional Executive Committee Member of Deloitte Middle East. Rana has over 25 years of experience in talent and human resources management corporate responsibility, diversity and inclusion, as well as leading purpose programs, corporate branding, digital presence, communications, and media programs. She is an advocate of economic empowerment, political participation, and advancement of women in, to leadership roles, and she has advised and worked on gender inclusion and economic empowerment projects with global UN organizations and multiple advisory boards, in the GCC and wider Middle East. Next, we have Isabel Barrick. She's the work and careers editor at the Financial Times. Isabel oversees a department that covers management, leadership, working life, graduate careers, as well as the ever pressing issue of the future of work. Isabel has a particular interest in workplace diversity and inclusion and is an editorial co lead on the 50 50 project which works towards equal numbers of men and women being quoted in the FT. Next, we have Ouija Labelle, founder and CEO of Be Inspired. She is developing a community focused on eradicating the lack of diversity within the marketing and advertising agency. Through Be Inspired, Ouija is bridging the gap between unrepresented talent and top organizations that are seeking to future-proof their company. Be sure to check out their event series, which addresses the issues of diversity in the industry and provides a basis for inspiration, knowledge, and digital skills advancement training. All right, so with that, let's hop in with the first question. Let's start by kind of level setting and unpacking the word privilege. That can be a loaded word for a lot of folks, um, but I wanna hear from you all, from your standpoint, what does privilege mean when, when we're talking about women in the workplace and how can that privilege be leveraged? So I'm gonna start with you on this one, Isabel. Thank you. Um, I guess I would, unpack privilege into two things, individual privilege and institutional privilege. And I have both of those. I'm an Oxbridge educated white woman in a professional job. And over the last five years or so, I've also been acutely aware of institutional privilege and the ways in which we are let into the room. And by that, I would mean where our voice, where voices are heard. And I think in my own workplace and many others over the last five years, women have been heard. Women do have privilege in the workplace. They're overwhelmingly white women like me. And I think from my standpoint, where I'm looking at privilege at the moment is my job is to open the door for other people, to bring them in 
and to use that privilege. And I think that's something, that's a conversation that's just starting to happen. Uh, but I'm delighted it is. Uh, I guess that's where I'm feeling I am with privilege at the moment and that we, uh, I'm, I speak for white women here, need to start doing some of the work is traditionally often the burden of which has often been on women of colour and other marginalised people to try and speak up for themselves. So I guess there's a really project going on in workplaces now, but it, you know, it's exciting, but privilege comes with a lot of hurdles and I think we're only at the beginning of a very long journey. Yeah, I think you make a good point that it, it is the beginning and it really starts with awareness and, and having these conversations. So thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, next I'll turn to Luisa. Let's, um, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Um, so for me, when I take the word privilege, I see it in two different lights. So sometimes you get to a certain height and you feel as though it's a privilege to be where you are, which in turn makes you feel like you're not worthy in there. So I think it's very, very important to be surrounded by a community of people, female or not, people that are working your organization or not, who are able to champion you and reinforce to you that you are there because of merit and because of what you can actually bring to the table. And the second part of the word privilege I see is being exempt from burden. So once you are in a position of privilege, that means that you don't have to go through certain things that other people are going through. But that kind of mindset and the negative effects, especially for the people that are behind you. So I think if you're in a position of and where you have privilege, it's for you to use that as a platform to actually carry other people's burden and create opportunities where they can actually thrive as well and follow you on your journey. Yeah, I think that you make a good point there. I can kind of take something that feels like a burden or um, has a bad connotation and, and use it in a really positive way, leveraging that platform. So, Rana, what would you add to that? I think I think privilege was well defined by my uh, colleagues on the panel. Uh, but I'd like to say Isabel was not part of the privileged community had she lived a hundred years ago. She, uh, the group she represents, if she represents anybody, I don't think any of us represent a white women or uh, other other uh, racial or women of color and so on. Uh, the way that Isabel became privileged took a lot of effort, took a lot of work, took a lot of lobbying. And I think there are lessons to be learned that could be applied now to women of color, could be applied to other minorities. There were legislations that were uh, lobbied for and sought. There were uh, uh, changes in the organizations. There were accountabilities. Boards had to do things. Management of boards were made accountable. Focus does help. And I suggest that some tactics worked uh, and some did not. And now it's, I think the smart thing to do is to look at what brought a group of women to the leadership table and then apply it to other women. And what did not work, let's not repeat the mistakes. It took us a hundred years to learn the hard way, burnt fingers, a speed which wasn't, or lack thereof, which wasn't what we expected, investments that were wasted, and maybe take the learnings from all of that and now be more smart in uh, uh, advancing other minorities and other people to the leadership table. Yeah, that's really powerful. Thank you. Um, I, I think kind of moving from there, um, many women, regardless of their differences or what amount of privilege or lack that they have, already find themselves outnumbered by their male counterparts in professional settings. So why then is it important that women who may otherwise be in the majority or do have more privilege when it comes to race, ethnicity, disability, all the various facets of privilege, why is it important that they make space from women from other diverse groups who maybe don't have that privilege. Um, for this one, I'll start with you, Lija. Unmute. <laughs> so I believe that um, as a woman, if you're charting new ones alone, it has power in that. But I think to gain more power and to be able to have more impact, it's best to move collectively. So so I'm an avid believer in the shine theory, 
which is the idea that when you help other women rise, we all shine. So by building other women, if you're like seeing a coworker doing well, shouting and saying that, cheer, cheering them on helps you shine brighter. So by doing this for people from diverse backgrounds, it helps you look and helps you promote yourself in a better light as well. Yeah, definitely. It, it, there's so much more power in numbers. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Rana, what would you uh, add to that? So uh, many uh, women who reach these leadership roles uh, just switch these leadership roles. They act as board members, they act as sweet, sweet, and may help a few women along the way, but it doesn't become a mission for them. It doesn't become Become uh, a purpose. They're not purpose driven in this area. And there are some who are. I, I sat on a board for a number of years. I was the only woman. And it gave me a louder voice. It allowed me to, uh, I became known. I mean, whenever gender was mentioned, whenever uh, uh, even inclusion was mentioned, everybody would look at me, looking at my reaction and what I expected. And that made uh, me want to rise to the occasion. So you do not start by being an advocate as much as you end up being an advocate before be, be you have. So to me, uh, the role has two sides, to pull seats at the table for other uh, women uh, because of that privileged position you are in, has like anything, a demand and supply. So I think uh, to create the demand for more positions on the board or even more diversity on the board, this is not a single woman's uh, or a group of women on a board game. Uh, it really is about influence. You need to influence the whole leadership to do that. Uh, you, it is not a project, it's not a task. My thinking of it is looking for every opportunity and it can come in a strategy, it can come in a program, it can in a presentation. It can come in assigning people to a certain initiative. It can come in recruiting directors to that board. In every one of these, it's like being a hunter and looking for opportunity to influence the group to create more seats. There could be programs, but these other opportunities I have found out to be as effective and should not be missed. Then there is the supply side. And a, and a woman uh, who is on these positions, if she is purpose-driven in this area, maybe she can even assert uh, uh, some other people around her is to find talent to fill these seats. And it is not as easy to say, that's the traditional uh, question that I can't find candidates, so we have to. Uh, sponsorship is a very good uh, thing, but I think the trick is we do, should not sponsor others that look us. The trick is to look for a, a, a bigger pool of who, who is to be sponsored to come on this, who is to be pushed, who is to be brought to the table, and, and so on. I had an incident today, which was quite interesting. I was channeled, uh, challenged uh, on a Zoom call earlier today by our regional CEO. He told me, we're talking about literally a sponsorship program. He said, how can you guarantee you will capture in the nominations for this program all the talented women in the organization? It, and mostly when you do these programs, the nominees come from the leaders of these women, and there are biases there, conscious and unconscious biases. So this is one important thing is who are you going to push to fill these things and make sure you're equitable and make sure you give everybody an opportunity. And those hidden people who may be achieving, but in a quiet corner, you give them a chance to come and sit at these tables if you create the demand. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think what you're saying about it being kind of purpose driven throughout the entire organization is so crucial that it can't be an add on. And, um, and, and then awareness of our biases is so uh, important to be able to make those changes. Um, Isabel, I know that you actually have some personal experience on this topic. Um, in 2020, the Financial Times expanded the annual gender pay gap report to become the gender and ethnicity pay gap report. So I would love to hear from you how the focus on ethnicity as well as gender helped to better address issues of bias. I th I'm really delighted we've done this. I think it's so important for us to be showing the way to other organizations in our area and beyond. And, the more, I guess the starting point is the more data we have, the more we can work with it. You know, what gets measured gets changed. And now we have our first ethnicity gap 
data, that's about 10%. And that's clearly because we don't have enough non-white colleagues in the top echelons at the FT. And so we know where we need to change now. And our gender pay gap overall is about 14% now it's in editorial where I work. That's coming down gradually. So it's so important to keep on at these things. And I just think it is the beginning of the journey, you know, because we will have to have some uncomfortable conversations around these figures, but it, that I hope that will lead to real change, you know, and I'm absolutely delighted. And I'm very distressed that the government has suspended gender pay gap reporting requirements for companies during the pandemic. We desperately need to get these back. Um, only half of the companies bothered to report because it was made uh, optional this year during the pandemic. Um, and unless we start this process and include ethnicity pay gap data, that a lot of progress is going to be lost when we all get back to work. That's a really good point, especially because we know that um, women and uh, minor ethnic minorities are even harder hit by the pandemic. So that gap at this time is, is um, definitely going to be a challenge. So, my next question is about the strategy. So, so many of you touched on the fact that it takes really strategic approaches. So when it comes to those strategies that address diversity and leadership, would you say that it's a matter of making more space for certain groups at the current table, building a bigger table, or something different altogether? So um, for this one, let's start with you, uh, Rana? I wish I had a good answer. <laughs> I wish it were an easy answer which says a bigger table or not. Like anything, it will not be one size fits all. In some organizations, maybe the smart thing to do is have a larger leadership uh, tableau or a large research table so that uh, you can accommodate more people. For just other organizations, because of commercial reasons, maybe it isn't possible. But I think it's extremely important not to make it a zero sum game. So it's not like uh, uh, there will be additions and then other groups will lose. Uh, it, it, at least perceptionally, it should not be like this because that could also backfire in the organization. Uh, I think also it's important to know that innovation in this space is no longer flexible time mentoring business champions and training and training of women. We keep on saying to make women ready or uh, this, whether a larger table or not, we need to train them. And I always say it's as if women go to different universities, they start in different careers than men. So you see most of the programs for advancing them are focused on them. And I think there is now realization that these programs should not be focused on them. Some should, and they are good, but they should be focused on the obstacle and not removing obstacle, but having a, a level playing field. Uh, so I think companies, uh, uh, the, the whole model of career progression was built around a singular model historically designed around men who rely on their spouses, their partners, in the past women, to handle mostly the maternal and home responsibilities. Our organizations are structured as such, and uh, many are changing now, but not enough. And I think companies for them to have more representation on these tables, whatever solution is bigger or more, more uh, accommodating tables, is to be proactive in creating multiple flexible career paths. So people can come from everywhere because many of the uh, minorities and people who are not reaching the top are not traditionally in that male step-by-step -step career ladder. They have more matrix type of careers. And I would suggest this is as well the focus there. And a last word on the current epidemic. The current epidemic was like uh, a time machine in the future. We were uh, predicting that in 10 years, even five to 10 years, we're going to have more flexible time. We will have the contingency workforce, the gig economy. It happened in months. Uh, and that was a surprise, but it also taught us a lesson. It, ta it taught us, as you were just saying, that uh, there are consequences that are adverse. No, they're not only positive, there are some adverse impacts on women. So a cautionary term here, if when we go to the new model, I'm not gonna say to the normal, 
the work, uh, the, the, the world of work has changed completely. Uh, women may elect to have these more flexible models, but they'll be less visible. If they continue to be the, the main caretakers in their home, if they are less visible, it is extremely difficult to advance as on the same pay as men uh, when they make certain, uh, uh, certain decisions in their careers. I don't know the answer to that, but that's a point to watch out in the future. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Luigi, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Um, so for me, I think it's important to make more space at the current table because building a bigger table can lead to more voices being lost and take us back to where we kind of started from. But if you and if we ensure that the current table is diverse and representative of the society that we find ourselves in, that in turn can to greater success for companies because of the diverse thoughts. So I have this favorite quote from Michelle Obama and she said that if you're sitting in a decision room and everyone looks like you, thinks like you, you will come up with less less than good work. But if so that's why it's important that if you have diverse tape um voice at the table, you're able to make better decisions. So I think rather than creating completely bigger tables, actually bring a diverse voice into the current tables that um, organizations have leadership. Uh, I think that's a good point. Um, uh, someone once told me that if you are, everybody around you is saying yes, 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 and no one's challenging you, then you don't have enough diverse thought at the table. So the idea of having those different perspectives and being challenged uh, definitely needs to take place in our current situation. Isabel, I I'd love to turn to you for this question as well. I think what is really interesting is to get a critical mass of difference. Uh, one, you know, uh, uh, Rana has obviously been a single woman on a board, but, you know, it can be very difficult to speak up if you're the only one of anything. And I think I've read research that says you, you have to have 30%, for example, of women or people of colour before things really start to turn. So it's enough to have a kind of one in, one out. I don't think we're going to be dismantling the patriarchy overnight, but it's uh, quite imaginative way of thinking and maybe a bigger table is what we need in the short term while we bring up a pipeline of new talent that is more diverse I guess would be my ideal scenario. Can I comment on the 30 percent? Uh, this magical number gets mentioned a lot and uh, mostly people look at it as a percentage of, uh, of a minority on a table. The research shows that 30 percent has two impacts actually. The, the group stops being perceived as a minority if they reach 30% in a parliament, say. And the second part is they stop behaving like a minority. And that is missed. the second part is missed a lot because there is certain behavior. When I was on the board by myself, I behaved like a minority. I felt that I was the ambassador of this, the ambassador of that, and that's okay. I don't mind that. But you feel like a minority, and there are so many stories I can tell about that. But if you have over 30%, then you begin to behave differently as a group, as individuals, and you will be perceived and, uh, and treated differently. That's, uh, I appreciate all of your varied uh, perspectives. I know this is a really hard question and um, I think you've all kind of given some food thought. And on that note, I'd love to encourage uh, attendees to be using the Q&A. Um, you can go ahead and submit any of your questions now as things come up and we'll have time for that at the end. Um, so the topic of doing this as a group and collaborating has come up many times in our conversation. So, I would love to hear some examples of how you've seen this done really well in the past. Um, Isabel, I'll start with you on this. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of examples from internally. In fact, was, there's one, a current one, where we have a next generation board uh, made up of younger, a diverse group of younger employees that sort of shadows the main board. And we, I think, got the idea from Santander, the bank. So there's an example of best practice that's being shared among different organizations. And this group called Next Generation Board, each of them reverse mentors a member of our main board. And I just think reverse mentoring is something that is really coming into its own in terms of sharing expertise and experience and fast tracking change, I think. 
I'm obviously not on the next generation board. I'm, old, I'm so heartened by what's going on and the and the fact that people are list pe leaders are listening to younger people and are learning from them. And I think that could be replicated in all organisations. It's not difficult to do. So that's my quick takeaway, I think. And the second thing is culture change. Uh, the 50-50 project, which we mentioned earlier, we're trying to get equal numbers of men and women in FT content. But more than that, internally, it's making us think about who gets who gets heard in the Financial Times? Who are we turning to? And that is widening the pool of people. It's getting people more exposure. And it's making us as journalists think differently about who it is that we're listening to and giving a voice on a global platform. So it's hard work. You know, we have to work hard to expand our networks. It doesn't come overnight. But I, I have great hope that these things will be embedded and will work in the long term. Yeah, that's great. I I want to kind of pause on that for one second because you were talking about reaching different groups and reaching groups of young people. So what would you say to folks who are kind of like, I don't know where to start. I know I need to bring in different voices. I know I need to reach out to the young people, but I don't have a young person in my network or, you know, how, how would you recommend people start with that? So for myself, you know, I I, don't, I had a very limited network and I'm making a sort of active effort to increase my network, to look in different places. I am we I'm often have an intern in my department. I'm asking those people to reach out and talk to their friends. I'm trying to talk to as many people I can and hear from them. When, I, when my interns come in, I ask them to write for me. For example, we had an intern recently who wrote about her experience of being a black woman and people black women's hair in the workplace that is not something the ft had ever written about but because this young woman had come in and talked about her experience you know we would never have got that article otherwise so i would say to people when we were allowed to go back in real life i'm going to make a massive effort to go out and meet people in real life at networking events uh, outside my network, you know, networks of young uh, journalists of colour, for example, or uh, Creative Access, the group that brings uh, people from underprivileged backgrounds into media and creative industries. It's so important. I've realised I've lived most of my life in a bubble, and I think we all just need to get out. Yes, I think when we're all able to, we will be eagerly awaiting that day. Um, and I, I read that piece uh, that you're speaking of about uh, hair in the workplace. It was, it was fantastic. Um, okay, so for this next question about collaboration, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, Rana. Uh, uh, just a comment on what Isabel did. Sometimes we find ourselves. Uh, once uh, I was asked to uh, uh, to present to be a participant on like this, and it was the audience of young people, and there was a specific question which I had no clue how to answer because it was very tied to young people. What I did a silly thing to be honest is I created a WhatsApp group, and I went to my nieces, nephews, and some uh, family young of that age. I told them to ask their friends their views on this matter, and they began to sending me uh, sending me on WhatsApp. Over two days, I got a tremendous amount of information by just using a little WhatsApp group, uh, just to educate my thinking. So I would I wasn't going to be an expert on what I was saying. But I was saying anecdotally these are the issues and blah 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 so it sometimes take little things to uh, go to networks in an unusual way now on the question of uh, of how how we can work together uh, between organizations i'm an advocate of leading organizations working together uh, on on causes on things like that be them climate be them uh, diversity and inclusion and so on i'll give two very quick examples one from dubai where i'm sitting now and uh, uh, so seven years ago a approximately uh, a group of people I know, women, four women, and they asked me to, to be with them. They are all leaders, created the first NGO in the Dubai International Financial Center, the DIFC, for mentoring women in finance. We are in the seventh year now. I'm on their advisory board. 
tremendously successful. CEOs, experts, Emiratis, and everybody raised their hands to mentor women in finance. And we have now an alumni group and cohort. And it was uh, one-to-one, and then it was spread to other countries in the region, Bahrain and uh, Lebanon and other countries. And that was an initiative where the funding was from companies who are, were providing mentors and mentees. This may, in your part of the world, sound very easy very uh, uh, to do, but this was a very real, uh, real contribution here uh, to, to, uh, to uh, growing women and allowing them to be mentored by different organizations. Another uh, group which I've seen a lot of collaboration with is uh, the National Commission for Lebanese Women. I was on their board for four years. I just uh, existed actually last month only. And this tells me that all the young women listening here, yes, we want to advance women in, uh, in business, but we want to address women in society. And the group here on this call are the more educated, the more exposed, the more privileged. Every single one of us, regardless of race, religion, color, we are probably more privileged than other women out there. And so if you are able to do work on national agendas, and there are uh, possibilities, you just have to look for them in your countries. And then you tend up to go to parliaments, meet presidents, meet prime ministers, and so on, and lobby for regulation. It has a multiplier effect that impacts us as women in business, but impacts the whole uh, society. Uh, in Lebanon, with the challenges it's passing through, it's been extremely difficult. But you get to meet you and women, you get to meet the World Bank, you get to meet all these programs. And we have a variety of ages of professional women working on these projects and definitely a multiplier effect uh, will be achieved. Um, there was a point that you made there about the uh, lobbying being crucial to moving and advancing women as a whole, not just in the workplace. Um, I, I imagine, especially for some of the you know, students or maybe young women that we have on the call, that can sound incredibly intimidating. Um, and maybe, you know, for older women as well. Um, so what would your thoughts be for them? If they sound really intimidated by that, do you have any recommendations of first steps or um, any kind of assuage those fears? I think like anything, they need to do their homework. They need to look in where they live, where their community is and where their interest is. And there are movements there. There are people who are already doing this type of work who and, and find the ones that are credible. There, there is plenty of NGOs, communities, associations, and so on. Uh, with, the, with what we have in social media, it's easy to see who are the most impactful. Not easy, but at least easier than many, many years ago. And just go volunteer at the beginning. Don't think you're going to change the world at the beginning. Go volunteer for a few hours on something. And then you build, you build your, your knowledge on where you want to focus, where your strength is, where you can contribute. And by contributing to this, you bring to your organization and to your career a lot, especially young women. They do bring uh, as well. I, I feel it is also, as I said, we are privileged as educated women and 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 it's not to give back only it's to enrich our careers and and uh, be able to help in our countries that's fantastic thank you um so now i want to turn to Luija specifically um because i imagine that you have some thoughts on this topic because this is what you do this is your work so um as we mentioned before your company be inspired is focused on eradicating the lack of diversity within the marketing and advertising industry there's a lot of collaboration that goes into that so can you share how partnerships have been key to your success uh, i think for this question um partnerships I wouldn't say partnerships has been key to being by success, but we've rather helped organizations become more successful in their um, search for more diverse talent force because we create um, opportunities where they're able to network with these young people. They're able to actually speak to them. They're able to have them in the organization to to find out what's actually um, available to them. So I think um, by us offering these opportunities, companies that don't know where to find a young diverse talent workforce are able to actually come to be be inspired and be connected to a diverse workforce but um this has 
definitely showed me that companies are now united in their intent to create an increased diversity. So there's a difference between actually just saying that you want a, a more diverse workforce or you want to help people reach high, um, higher heights, but actually putting it into action by getting doing insight days by getting young people into the organization and people from diverse backgrounds shows us as an organization and shows people society that people are an organization are actually making positive strides to increase diversity within the organization yeah so i guess it sounds more that you've been able to be that partner that's been key to their success um yeah so like bridging the gap between yeah. So actually, I'd like to hear what what are what are some of the young people saying? Because um, coming from a communications background, that has been my experience as well before, where it can feel like there's some barriers. So so what are the feedback you've heard from the young people who you've helped be a bridge for? I um, a lot of the feedback is that they didn't know that this existed. So I'll give you an example. When we had our insight day at Sky. Sky is in Osterley, really far away, and loads of young people didn't know that there a, was a whole different world in that space. All they knew was that oh, Sky was the broadband that I use, or Sky is where I watch TV, but they didn't know that it was a, it's, a, it's got an amazing campus. There's so many different opportunities there. So just by having that one insight, they, it changed mindset. So I think that's the most important thing that a lot of people get out of um, insight days with the organizations that we partner with or the events that we have is the fact that they're able to see things from a different perspective and they're able to know what's actually available to them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I kind of like to shift gears here. Um, and the question is specifically for you, Rana. Um, I know both in 2017 and 2018, you were ranked by the Financial Times as one of the top five global champions of women in business. So global champion of women in business, when you think about that, what would your biggest advice be to women who want to, who aspire to be champions for women in business as well? but they may not see themselves in a position of leadership or power or influence. Maybe some middle management, middle management or career starters. I know we talked about this a little with um, advocacy specifically, but more broadly, what would your advice to them be? Let me, let me focus on middle management in this answer. I think to be honest, middle management women are slightly neglected as drivers for this change. We, we always focus whenever we talk about this topic at the tone on the top, at the top, at what CEOs should do and so on. Uh, that is important. The funding is there and everything, but actually the people who make it happen are normally in middle management. And my first thought for middle managers that there may be uh, such women on the call today is you help others by not dropping off the corporate ladder. Your decision to drop off the corporate ladder impacts the generation that's going to come after you. That is the biggest gift that you can give to career starters, the young people who are uh, coming in the organization. Now, we all may not have control over what circumstances face us. There are seasons in a woman's life, uh, when they have kids, and so on. But we have a choice in how we respond. And women who step off the ladder just being trapped in a vicious cycle. They're loaded for sticking to their beliefs, but uh, uh, by going off the balance sheet, so to speak, but they make it harder to achieve gender parity in the executive ranks because the pool shrinks. Now, uh, and they are more visible to younger women as role models. The word role model is very risky and specifically for minorities. Uh, if people are told that my role model is somebody who looks like me in a leadership position, I'm missing out on a lot either my race or my color. So whenever anybody asks me, what's your role model? I say it's pieces of a lot of people because I like in her this, I like in him that, I like in somebody I've never met, but I, I, I heard something about this. So I think we should be careful about thinking of any single person or single couple of people and pushing them with storytelling on our uh, websites as organization, look at this person's story. Uh, role model each one of them has a success story that's probably not replicated it was their circumstances what happened to them so best to pick up uh, from everybody so uh, back to to a little bit uh, the younger woman i think uh, th their behaviors because they impact others around them 
they have to watch after a few things. Uh, I can speak about this now or later on. There is something I normally speak about called career limiting behavior, CLBs, and changing them to career boosting behaviors. And these are little, little things by doing invisible work and not, uh, not uh, promoting their achievements, whether young woman or even middle management woman, by not networking, they say women cluster and men network. You go to a conference and somehow I tell them there is like a magnet in, on every woman's chest and they whirr, come together and they begin talking. And if you eavesdrop, they're talking sometimes about family. I am stereotyping intentionally here because this is what happens. You look at big pictures and you see a few women with the men, uh, with the leaders talking, but the, a lot of the women clustering. And there are other tips that with their behaviors, middle management women could really, really uh, impact uh, what's happening around them. We'll talk about them later on on the call. Yes, let's definitely make sure to come back to those. Um, I personally would love to hear them, take down some notes, I'm sure lots of others would as well. Um, Isabel and Luigi, was there anything that you want to add to this, the idea of being a champion of women for maybe the managers or career starters? I think that's a really fascinating point about not an obligation to stay in the workplace, but but when we think, I often think now about who's coming after me. And that's something I didn't think about 10 years ago. You know, I was very involved in my own drama of having small children and trying to cling on to a job on a national newspaper, which wasn't really built for women with small children. And I think because I clung on, I've developed a resilience. And I think that's something quite valuable now in the workplace. And I try to you know talk to younger women now about the challenges they face and I think you know we all stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us and I can see now we're coming into a four or five generation workforce and what I often say to Gen Z and my children are Gen Z I you know don't undersell yourselves because you know you may be going into work in a pandemic but actually what you've got is incredibly important and I'm I'm just delighted to talk to young people who are not underselling themselves in this marketplace because what they have in terms of being digital natives, you know, totally across all technology, but also the way that they think about ESG, green things in a completely natural way, is going to transform our workplaces. So I feel really privileged that I've hung in there long enough to see this new generation come through. Um, for me, I think it's very important for people to understand that you're not too small to be an inspiration to someone that's looking up to you. Many people that are coming up behind you, there could be a colleague that sees you as a source of inspiration. So it's important that you allow yourself to be of hope for someone else to voice out when you think that things aren't going right or to voice out even if you think, so, you think things are going um, right because there's people that are looking at you there's people that will see what you're doing and be inspired by exactly what you're doing so it's important to not quit even if you find that things are challenging and just to continue to persevere everything that you're doing really yeah I think that's a good point there's there's always someone who is younger than you and as far down the journey as you who's who's got their eyes on you so it's a good point um, so let's look at the other side of the coin then. So what about women who are in leadership positions? Um, if you all had to leave them with one parting thought about how they can help ensure their organization's investing in diversity and equity, what would it be? And um, let's start with Isabel for this one. Um, I think quite simply is am I creating a safe and happy psychologically safe workplace no change happens where people are unhappy you know if you're a crappy boss nobody is going to buy in nobody's going to stay so I think it's incumbent on all of us who are leaders to create a psychologically safe space where people can speak up and feel comfortable and I don't think that's said enough we might it's no point going off on all these fancy DNI initiatives they won't work if the managers and the leaders are not creating the right environment. Yeah, the foundation definitely has to be there or else you're building all of these initiatives on top of kind of shaky ground. That's a great point. Um, Rana, what would you say to that? 
So my parting thought uh, to what women in leadership should be saying, maybe an ask actually, is to reinforce within their organizations that individual success is not a solo sport. It never was, and what is being asked now for is not novel. No leader around that table, male or woman, got the top table by themselves, although some, by the way, uh, actually claim and, and load their, their successes. They had other people's support behind them. They had sponsorship behind them. And these were not noticed in the past. For men, they're not noticed. They're taken for granted, but they still happen. They may not be under branded programs with fancy uh, colors and labels and initiatives, but for these peoples to have reached, they were there. So what we are asking for is that simply the organization needs to do the same for women, for minorities. What was happening in the DNA of the organization to bring all these uh, uh, privileged leaders mostly men, mostly white men to the top, needs to happen for others. And if it needs uh, us to organize them into programs, that's fine. But there should not be that perception that we're doing something exceptional and that is just tailored to those minority groups. It is already happening and has been happening for tens and hundreds of years for white men. That's a great point. And you know, why reinvent the wheel, <laughs> but how we can expand it to be used among other groups. Um, Luisa, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think for me, it will just be to just not talk the talk, but walk the walk. Um, it's important to push boundaries and create opportunities. Um, constantly looking back at their younger self, trying to get into the industry for the first time, and then um, and being faced with all these challenges and looking at people that are currently faced with the same challenges and to be able to do everything in their power to let it be known that they are an ally and they are championing diversity and equity for women within with their own actions because after all a journey of a thousand miles always begins with just a simple step thank you um so I see a lot of great questions coming in um, so as we start to blip through some of these, I, I think let's circle back to, um, now I know you were talking about some of the career limiting and the shift to career boosting behaviors. You said you had some other thoughts there. Why don't we talk through some of those? I'd love to hear some more of that. Sure. Uh, a few of, that, uh, of those would be uh, women tend to do more invisible work than men, simply. They raise their hand for uh, more work, and then they feel the sense of how come they can't see what I'm doing. We all do that. If they don't see it, that's their problem. Actually, it's your problem if they don't see it, because men tend to, and I don't want to stereotype too much, tend to uh, complicate their achievements more. Uh, also, women don't ask for what they want. They assume they deserve what people, uh, and, and generally this, of course, people should know and should tell them. So they assume that if it's going to be a raise or a promotion, uh, it, it, things are fair and things will come their way. No, it's going to happen sometimes. And you will be surprised, I think many young women will be surprised how much they will be listened to if they raise their hand or they walk in and say, I want that assignment. I want that challenging assignment. Most of the answers that it happened to me, uh, even as a senior leader, I went and said, how come? Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, story. It's, it's an interesting story. I was, uh, it was, it was a large partners meeting and they announced the nominating committee for the board. I was put on the nominating committee. This is a coveted uh, role, but anybody on the nominating committee for the board is conflicted, cannot be, cannot nominate themselves to the board. So I went uh, to, to the, uh, the time, the chair, and I said, how come you put me? He said, we think you have good skills to choose uh, the board members. I said, did you ask me if I wanted to be a board member myself? And they were surprised. They said, it didn't occur to me you wanted. I said, did you ask me? A week later, they sent an email to everybody saying, Rana is removed from that nominating committee, just that. So people knew I had nominated myself. I ended up to be on the board by vote, but it did not occur to them to, to ask me. Now, is it a, a bias? Is it, 
it just happened. And then I went into action about it. Uh, I think women also should take more risks. We tend not to take more risks. Uh, we tend to, uh, to be a bit risk averse. Uh, so let's take an assignment we think we're not 100% qualified for because uh, uh, Men do that and they do deliver and I think we do deliver. Uh, and maybe one more one uh, is around flexing the style and actions between what is perceived as good female attributes of teamwork and empathy and what is traditionally known as masculine, uh, masculine traits are defined as aggressiveness, assertiveness, and confidence. I'm not uh, promoting aggressiveness, but I'm promoting a flex style, depending on the situation, sometimes using quote unquote these masculine traits. I don't think they were uh, branded for men, but these are proven to, to, to help in success, especially on assertiveness and confidence, and choose the situation, then we uh, would be even in a better position than only the men who only use this. And there are men who also flex the style. Uh, and uh, that, I think, uh, these are a few of uh, the tips that come. And these are learned behavior patterns. You can, one can develop them and, and, and do them. And my last one is something Isabel was saying about her career choices. She did not allow short-term considerations for a season in her life to affect her long-term career. I am entirely surprised by how many wo women come to me uh, in my organization and, and elsewhere and make a decision on what they are passing through today that invariably is gonna have impact on their career in 10 years. That's fantastic, thank you so much.